Hi, welcome to the Online Jewelry Academy. I'm John R. and I'm your instructor. Today I'm going to show you how to use Shrinky Dink to make a cute necklace like this one in front of me. Shrinky Dink is a plastic material that offers a wide variety of possibilities for jewelry items. In subsequent videos, I'll show you how to make a ring similar to this one and a pair of earrings. Let me clear these items away and let's get started. Our first step is to go over how to make the components for our jewelry. Now, as you can see looking over here, I've made a series of charms. These five pieces will go into making a necklace. Now, shrinky dink material is essentially plastic. It's plastic that's milled while it's warm to a very thin layer, and then when you heat it up, it shrinks and becomes thicker. Now, there's two types. There's the white type or opaque type, which will work well with permanent markers or with an inkjet printer. Now, the other is the transparent, and it looks a little translucent here, but that's because it has one shiny surface, and if you flip it over, it has a lightly sanded surface. The sanded surface works well with colored pencils, while you want to use this clean side with permanent markers. Now, the way you manipulate this is with either a pair of scissors or with cutters. Now I have a hole punch, which you can use instead of actually having to drill these pieces later. So that makes this project a lot easier to do with children. And I've got some paper punches here that will cut me perfect squares and circles like the ones on my board. Now you're also going to need a variety of colored pencils and a variety of permanent markers. Now, if you make a mistake with the permanent markers, you can always correct it by taking a little bit of alcohol or nail polish remover on something soft like a cotton swab or a piece of tissue and just wipe it away. Now, you will also need some type of pencil in some cases to draw your pattern. If you make a mistake with a regular pencil, just erase it. You won't have any problems and it won't show up on the finished product at all. So let me show you how to make some of the items that I have over here. Now, before I do that though, let me talk a little bit about what we're going to use to shrink them. Now, you want to use a dedicated toaster oven. They're cheap. They're probably twenty to thirty dollars at your local store and what this does for you is it prevents you from having to use a Dutch oven or another large cooking vessel in your oven. You don't want to do this in the oven that you prepare food in. If you don't have one of these, you can also get away with using a heat gun from your local hardware store. And you can probably pick one of those up for about twenty to thirty dollars. Now when you prepare the items, you may want to create a cookie sheet or tray with aluminum foil on it and on top of that you could use a piece of brown paper bag or some cooking parchment from the grocery store. The oven should be set to 325 degrees Fahrenheit and you want to let it preheat because whenever you open that door a lot of the heat escapes and it crashes. So keep your temperature up by preheating and you may want to actually invest in a little thermometer so that you can make sure that you're not setting your oven a little too high. Now, it takes about one to three minutes for the plastic to heat up and begin to flex and shrink. And once you see it come down to the size that you think that it's going to be, leave it in the oven for about 30 seconds longer. Then, when you take it out, handle it carefully because it's going to be hot you want to let it set for about 15 seconds to cool. And whatever shape that you leave it in to cool, it's going to maintain that shape for its lifetime. So anyway, let me clear some of this space and I'll show you how to prepare the material. Before you start, you may want to put on your safety glasses. You're not going to be working with a hot torch or items that are going to be flying around in the air, but you never know, so always be safe. And if you haven't watched our safety video, you might want to stop now and take a look at that before you proceed. Okay, I have on my bench a number of items that can be used for the creation of these little elements. 
Now I have a variety of templates here. These could be used to accurately color in certain shapes, or you could use them to actually cut out an unusual shape. You would do this with some kind of sharp uh, cutting tool like an X-Acto blade, or a pair of scissors if you draw the shape onto your shrinky dink material. Now, let me show you how to cut it. It's really easy. I'm going to cut this with the large paper punch. You can get them at most stationary shops. All you have to do is slide the material in and then just push down. And voila, you have a perfect circle to play with. Now, to make it wearable, you want to have a hole in it. And we're going to use the paper cut or paper punch to do that. You just want to put the piece inside of the paper punch and just give yourself enough material behind the hole so that when it shrinks down, it won't have a problem of pulling off of your jewelry item. So this one is pretty much ready to be decorated. Now, when you're using this opaque material, you're limited to using the permanent markers. And the thing that's kind of fun about this is that if white is an important part of your design, the material is already white, so just don't color it. You'll have white. Now, I've got a nice palette of analogous colors. I've got yellow, orange, kind of a reddish plum, and a purple. Now, you can do whatever you want, but you probably want to be a little bit loose and easy about the coloring of this material. So, what I would say is, just start with your central area and work to the outside. Now, if you're doing this with kids, you probably want to help them out in terms of choosing what types of colors and what arrangement of things that they might want to do. Um, give them some creative freedom, but you might want to help them make something good so they'll be proud of it. So anyway, I'm just going to draw on here a little bit, and we will shrink this up in just a second so you can see how it comes out. And I'm purposefully leaving a lot of the white so you can see how it plays out. So as you can see, I started with the yellow in the center, and I kind of worked out with colors that started to get warmer and darker. So that's all there is to coloring it. Now, with the transparent material, you have a little bit more variety of options to play with. And you can play with colored pencils on one side and permanent markers on the other. So what I like to do is I like to imagine what would be in the background and draw that with my colored pencils and then think about what might be in the foreground and draw that with my permanent marker. So in this case, I'm going to draw a sunset. So what I would start with is the colored pencils on the back side. So let me put a piece of, let me use a piece of this white underneath it so you have an easier time of seeing this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the top facing me and I'm going to just start to draw a little bit of blue sky. Now before I get too far, I'm going to jump in and take a white pencil and I'm going to draw myself a little cloud. And you can define the cloud with your blue pencil if you want to. Just go in and give it a little bit of definition so that it looks nice and fluffy. Anyway, I'm going to continue with my blue pencil, and I'm going to go a little bit lighter, creating sort of a gradient effect. And you want to go all the way out to the sides. And at the bottom, I want to have a little bit more of a sunset. So a sunset to me might be a little bit orange near the horizon, and that might lighten up to oh, say, a, a golden yellow color. And you can kind of push that color up into your blue sky a little bit. So you end up with something like that. Now, what would go in front of that? To me, maybe a flock of birds flying by. So I'll turn this over, and on the front side, I could easily give myself a little bit 
drawing of birds flying in front of that cloud. Maybe they're flying over the ocean or something. All right. And three is a good number because in any composition, we probably want to have an odd number of elements. OK, so the one thing I'm missing is the hole at the top. So what I'm going to do is put it in, move it down, and give it a little punch. And now it's ready to be shrunk down. All right, let me clear some of these things away, and I will show you how to shrink your material down. Okay, I'm going to show you now how to shrink the material that I already showed you how to color in the previous step. Now, a heat gun, similar to this, works a lot faster than the toaster oven. So, and it makes it a little bit better for you to see rather than hiding it in the oven. All right, so you can see I've got my pan set up with some aluminum foil on it and with a brown piece, a piece of paper on top of that. Now, this may make a noise that's a little bit louder than I can talk over, so let me explain one thing first. You want to be careful with where you position the heat gun. You don't want to have the piece of plastic, especially when it's hot, fly off on somebody else who might be sitting across from you. So pay attention to where you aim the hot air. All right, I'm going to turn this on, and we're going to get started shrinking. Remember, it's only going to take a couple minutes. Okay, now you saw what I was talking about. They tend to fly around when you're heating them up. So you want to pay attention to where they're going. And it's probably a good idea to have a cookie sheet or some kind of a pan with an edge. Now this one is upside down, but when I turn it over, you can see that there are my birds visible on top and my sunset is visible behind them along with the cloud. Now, you may notice that that one and the other one that I did, which is right here, that they're not exactly flat. Now, if you want them to go completely flat, what you may want to do is lift them off of your baking sheet and put them onto something like a ceramic tile to cool. Now, be careful. They're going to be hot when you take them out of your oven. Remember, you're setting your oven to 325. So be sure to use some type of oven mitt or some other item that's going to help you handle the pan. And you may actually need, say, a pair of pliers or tweezers to pick them up. Now laying them on a flat surface like a ceramic tile will make them go perfectly flat. But sometimes you may also want to shape the items. Okay, I've got a lot of other things to shrink down. So I'm going to put them in the toaster oven and I'll be back in just a second. Well, I've taken our items out of the toaster oven, and I've set them up for you to take a closer look at. Now, you'll remember that this is the original size that we started with, so they all shrunk down quite a bit. Now, you can see how the pieces that I demonstrated how to color for you are in the center of our display, and it's amazing how exciting they look once they've shrunk down. And you, I think in the uh, sunset scene with the birds, you can really get a sense of dimension there. And I've placed a, a square version with the birds flying onto a, a, a power line just to give you an idea of other options that you could have other than just putting one hole in and treating it like a charm. Now, if you look at the items that we did for the necklace, these charms came out great. And what I like about them is the fact that since we only used colored pencil to prepare those pieces of plastic, we ended up with something that looks very watercolory. And the, the softness of the colors is something that would look very nice with like a lighter, more summery pastel outfit. All right, well, let me take a minute and I'm going to show you how to do the assembly portion of this project. Okay, it's time to turn the components that we made out of the shrinky dink into a piece of jewelry. 
as you can see, I've laid out the necklace that I'd like to make. Notice that the charms are well balanced. I've got an odd number of them. I have a chain that I purchased from a local jewelry supplier, and I have enough jump rings to attach the charms to the necklace. First thing that you want to do is hold the, the uh, chain up by its clasp and let it drop, and you should be able to find the exact center of the chain. Once you've done that, you want to slip a jump ring through that opening, and then you can apply your central charm. Now, to shut this jump ring down, just simply grab both sides of the jump ring with pliers and push them shut. You kind of have to bring them together and push them together. Okay, so we got one down and have four more to go. Now, in terms of the placement of where these charms should be, what you might want to do is just simply count jump rings away from the one that you went through. So in this case, I think what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to go one, two, three, four, five, and I'm going to grab that jump ring with my pliers. There we go. And now I'll pass a jump ring through that one. And I'm going to pick up the next charm. Now, one thing that you want to be careful to do is to be sure to put the same side on, of the charm to match the same side of the other charm. In other words, if you put the sanded side forward, put the sanded side of the next charm forward as well. And one, two, three, all I'm going to do is close that jump ring. And now I've got two down. And then I've got three more to go. Now that all the jump rings are closed, we have a nice little charm necklace. I hope you've enjoyed this project, and I hope you'll tune in and look at the other video projects that we have on the OnlineJewelryAcademy.com. Thanks for watching.